Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our uh, ordinary meeting four for the year 2019 on today, on the 24th of April 2019. Um, I'd just like to kick off by uh, well, uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land which we speak and thanking the All Shops community for uh, hosting us today at this, this council meeting. Um, I want to invite uh, Pastor Peter Prang to say the prayer from St Paul's Church in Merrill. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning. On behalf of Merrill Ministries Fellowship, I wish to express our thanks for the opportunity to offer prayers for the Council. We pray. Almighty God, you created and blessed the concept of government, and through the Apostle Paul, called on all people to support the governmental leaders you have given us. So we approach you today to ask for your blessings for this council, give them the wisdom and strength to know the needs of your people on the Fraser Coast, and to act fairly and beneficially for them. May they, with careful, well thought out reasoning, make the decisions to provide good structure and a climate of safety for all their constituents. We pray in confidence of your love and blessings in the name of the resurrected Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Peter. Um, ordinary item two is apologies. Uh, we have no apologies, but we have a received uh, leave of absence from the mayor, so we'll just note that one. No, we don't need to. It's an approved leave. Um, item three is disclosure of interest. So, councillors, if any councillor has a disclosure of interest. Seriously? Yep, it's working. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I declare that I have a perceived conflict of interest in the matter of item 10.3.4 um, in that my, the nature of my interest in this matter is that the Madden Family Trust owns a commercial property located in Bazaar Street, Maryborough, just outside of the area under consideration for the expressions of interest. The nature of my relationship with the Madden Family Trust is that I am a trustee of the trust and a potential beneficiary under the trust. There may be a perception that the Madden Family Trust may be benefited from the proposal to build a new council administration centre and or library and as such I may be directly benefited. I will be dealing with this declared conflict of interest by leaving the meeting while this matter is discussed and voted on. So thank you Councillor Madden. Um, as Councillor Madden is has indicated she will leave the, moon, uh, the room for this 10.3.4. We are not required to vote on it. That's correct, Acting CEO. Thank you. Council, any other conflict of interest, councillors? Thank you, Councillor Sanderson. <laughs> um, item four is mayoral minutes, and there is no mayoral minute. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to uh, move a procedural motion to that the standing orders be suspended for a moment. Uh, to move two condolence motions. Do we need to vote on that? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So you're moving this motion, the yes, procedural motion. Thank, thank you, Councillor Sanderson. All those in favour? Carried. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two condolence motions over recent uh, tragic events that have occurred. Uh, firstly, uh, locally, the passing of the two young Japanese exchange students who lost their lives while on excursion to Fraser Island on the 29th of March. Uh, the two boys from the Kanagawa University High School in Japan, uh, their lives now tragically cut short and the lives of their families, friends, fellow travellers and those attending the scene affected forever. Lake Mackenzie is one of the most beautiful and picturesque locations in our entire region and uh, this event is unheard of in this location previously and our, our thoughts and prayers go to their families and friends. Secondly is uh, for the recent events, or do we do it as, okay, two separate? For each one? Okay. 
think I'm happy to move that. So the, uh, my understanding of the way our standing orders work in relation to condolence motions is that the standing is the vote. Is the vote. So we don't have... So you'd need a seconder for a condolence motion unless we change our standing orders to not require that. So, hang on. Are we going to do both at once or one at a time? So just be clear. So, right, so we'll do the stand, if everyone could please stand now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, secondly, as, as we'd all be aware, the tragic events that happened in Sri Lanka on Easter Sunday, of all days, on the 21st of April, where terrorists attacked uh, particularly Christians celebrating uh, on Easter Sunday with a, a series of uh, explosive devices, at least three at churches and a further three at hotels. And this has left so many lives um, destroyed and, and tragically cut short. Um, so far as, as far as I understand, there's a death toll of over 320 lives um, and at least 500 still further injured with the toll rising. Uh, I understand ISIS have claimed responsibility for the devastating attacks and it, it's just, as I was discussing it yesterday, that we're now in a world where it's not just soldiers attacking soldiers under orders given, but extremists preying on the innocent and the most vulnerable in locations that should never see this sort of behaviour. And uh, I think yeah, it's a devastating set of circumstances and uh, we'd just like to move for a condolence motion for those lives lost in Sri Lanka. Move by, seconded by uh, Councillor Taylor. Um, please stand. Thank you, Councillor Truscott. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to uh, move another procedural motion that the standing orders now be resumed. A second is required for that. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Rightio. To our agenda. Um, our first item of business is the confirmation of the meeting minutes from ordinary meeting three from the 27th of March this year. If I could please have a mover and a second it. So it's moved by Councillor Hanson, seconded by Councillor O'Keefe. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Um, item 5.2 is the meetings of the special, uh, sorry, is the meeting minutes of the special meeting um, from April the 15th. 
If I could please get a mover and seconder for that. Moved by Councillor Madden, seconded by... Come on, don't be shy. Councillor Taylor. All those in favour? And that's carried unanimously again. Item six is addresses and presentations, so I'll hand over to the Acting CEO. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Mayor. So uh, public participation this morning, we had uh, five uh, residents who addressed the council. Uh, first up, we had Jennifer Wagner, who uh, raised a range of issues around drainage at Bruce Street, uh, microbat uh, boxes uh, to deal with uh, mosquitoes, as well as uh, the location of uh, trenches for, for sewerage. Um, following that, we had Elizabeth Wiley, who again addressed us uh, regarding drainage, this time around Bronze Street and uh, regular flooding um, and responsibility regarding uh, the drainage network uh, for residents and, and council. Um, third up, we had Earl Albion uh, address us, again raising uh, drainage and flooding issues, and particularly around uh, bitumen, the bitumen crossing at the front of his property and where the, the private and council responsibilities overlap. Following that, we had David Windsor, um, who raised some important issues around the uh, access in and out of Aldershot, and uh, particularly um, when, when flooding happens uh, to the eastern side of Aldershot, that uh, people can be cut off. Um, and finally, we had uh, Graham Wode addressing the council regarding some, some matters uh, which have been brought to our attention at previous uh, meetings and the resp responses to those, those matters, uh, particularly around um, uh, Guava Street, Tiger Street and Lamington Bridge um, and a range of flooding concerns. Uh, so they were the, the five uh, issues that were raised in uh, public participation today and we'll get responses back to, to those residents. Is this, there we go. So the the resolution would be twofold: that um, the CEO uh, one investigate and report uh, on the benefit of micro bats, and I'm assuming micro bats because I'm I've never even heard of it. Is that micro bats as it sounds? M I C R O B A T S. Yep. Um, in combating mosquitoes in the Aldershot area, and two, uh, provide an update on drain the drainage network in Aldershot and any policy that requires homeowners to find a uh, drainage solution for um, council easements, is it, or council nature strips? Yeah. Yeah. Or ca a council land. Yeah. That's probably... Is that, did you want to read that out? Or have you got that? I haven't got the last book. Uh, I've got first let the CEO investigate and report on the benefits of microbats in combating mosquitoes in the Aldershot, in Aldershot. Yeah. Um, and yep. And two, provide an update on the drainage network in Aldershot. Um, yep. Yeah. So, 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 up, so provide an update on, drainage, on the drainage network in Aldershot and any policy that requires homeowners 
to find drainage solutions for council land. And I think you understand the meaning of that. Um, I'd, be, I'd be moving that to resolution. Motion. Right, yeah. So, can you, your councillor Madden, are you going to second that motion or ask a question? I'm going to ask a question of the mover. And could uh, I notice in the first section of that you've actually, around the microbats, have you, you've limited it to a report around the benefit to Aldershot. Um, given that we have so many areas, Puna, Mer river heads uh, that are uh, impacted by mosquitoes. I'm just wondering whether we could just put, instead of all the shot, the Fraser Coast Regional Council area, would you be happy to adjust it? Well, I, I, I did think about that, but the reason why I wanted to isolate it to old shot is that we could have a specific example rather than have to do a lot of work on it. And then once that resolution's back, you can then make um, uh, the, the actual, this is just information gathering. Um, if it comes back, microbats are, are, aren't effective or are effective. You can then form a resolution that impacts the entire um, regional area. Fair enough. Happy. Can I just get a clarification second, second, um, on the second part, uh, Councillor Taylor, um, where it says that uh, any policy that requires homeowners um, well, on um, council land. I just want to try to understand whether it's a drainage related or is it driveway crossing? Well, drainage and driveway crossing. Okay. Well, right, if Marlene, you can note that, please. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I, I, I'm going to keep speaking in this even. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. <laughs> yeah, it's neat. Um, there's obviously two parts to this. One is the obligation. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> should be. <laughs> it's. <laughs> You're sitting, <laughs> he's sitting there turning it off. You, you told him, this is your mayoral minute. Quiet, Stuart. Um, there's obviously two parts to this. One is that um, there has been a drainage solution in parts of Old Shot and not other parts. And I'm not sure whether that's been properly communicated to um, council or to the community because they're seeing work being done but not sure on what those areas are. So I guess the report, I'd like to cover that, but also what are the requirements for homeowners because it, it appears that in some of the areas, um, council has done the drainage work and including the driveway um, at the cost of council. Yes, but, works, yeah. yeah, yet now in other areas in Aldershot, um, those homeowners are required to provide the funding to do their own driveway. So I just need to understand how that policy was formed and what we're doing into the future to make sure it's equitable. Yep. Yes. Rightio. So move Councillor Taylor. Councillors can I have a seconder for that. So Councillor Madden. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. Um, so we will need to move that your reports get yeah, the CEO's report. So can I have someone to remove the report? Councillor uh, Hanson, seconded by Councillor Sanderson. All those in favour? Thank you, carried unanimously. Right, yeah, item seven is uh, deputations. We do not have any deputations today. Item eight is petitions. Um, councillors, if there's any petitions to be presented. Councillor O'Keefe. Okay. It doesn't work. Hello. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr Acting Mayor. Um, I would like to submit this petition on behalf of Moira Charlton and Deb O'Brien. Uh, there are 96 signatures attached to this petition and there are two parts to the petition. The petition reads, we the undersigned are concerned citizens who urge council to act now to erect speed limit signs that clearly identify legal speed and or construct speed deterrent mechanisms to limit hooning. And second part of the petition is construct a footpath necessary for the many pedestrians, including the children who attend Urangan Point Primary School, people with disabilities using mobility aids, accessing the marina, and the tourists who utilise Damon Street from the recently developed Pier Caravan Park. Um, and the petition summary is um, safe speed limit management and safe pedestrian access on Damon Street between Elizabeth 
and Polgol Street, Surangan. Thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. Can I have a seconder for Councillor Taylor? All those in favour? Again, that's unanimous. Thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. Can you present your... Can we have your petition to Marlene, please? Um, councillors, any other petitions? Thank you. Um, item nine on our agenda today is the committee, uh, the meeting minutes from the Fraser Coast Audit Committee um, from, on pages 27, with the officer's recommendation on page 27. Um, can I have someone to move that motion, please? Councillor Lewis? A seconder, please? Councillor Madden? Uh, councillors, any comment? No comment? Um, all those in favour? Thank you, Council carried unanimously again. <coughs> right, our item um, 10.1.1 is our open resolutions register, and that's on pages 33 to, from 33 to 63, with the officer's recommendation on the 33 councillors. Can I please have someone to move this one? Councillor Hanson. Councillor Chapman. Yep. Councillor Hanson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. After all that hassle, I just have a question to Director Parsons about an update on Burham Town. You got a page number there? Uh, no, but I'll find it. Uh, I can provide an update uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Hanson, a, a consultant, has been uh, commissioned to undertake an um, outline of the options that have been defined by staff uh, for the development uh, of that site. So that will come back to uh, a councillor briefing and then a council committee uh, in, sorry, the May meeting that's oh, scheduled for. Thank you, Director Keith. Um, councillor Lewis. Yes, uh, thanks, Mr Acting Mayor. Uh, just, just a comment and then a question to the Acting CEO, although in his capacity as Director. Um, first of all, uh, on page 41, that uh, resolution uh, um, about koala habitats and corridors, uh, I note that the last meeting I raised the fact that the, the resolution as set out in the uh, register didn't fully reflect uh, what uh, was envisaged and I appreciate that that's now been tidied up. But, um, and uh, I think that's going to make it uh, clearer for future generations, if it takes that long, uh, to pursue these issues. Um, that resolution and uh, the uh, uh, Street Trees resolution on page 50, and then there's a subsequent resolution in, also in relation to uh, uh, Street Trees. Uh, I can't quite direct you to the page, but uh, it'll be... Page 63, thank you. Um, the, these and other resolutions were recently the subject of a discussion that I had uh, with the director and with a couple of uh, exec managers, um, and there was a discussion about bringing uh, um, uh, a report back to council um, to gather in these various resolutions about uh, the issues raised uh, um, uh, specifically with respect to street trees, future subdivisions and so on. Uh, so that these could be gathered in and perhaps a roadmap developed. Um, I just wondered whether the director might be able to inform council councillors uh, just very briefly um, uh, of the proposals in relation to that report. Uh, uh, thank you, Councillor Lewis, through you, uh, Mr Acting Mayor. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, the current thinking is that we'll bring back a report um, likely for the June meeting to try and bring all of these pieces of work together because... Um, they're all independently important pieces of work, um, but at the moment we're, we're a little bit disjointed in terms of we've got a whole range of uh, work happening in the planning side of uh, my department as well as in the natural environment and the, the open space area. So what I'm cl 
keen to get before council and, and get on the public record is a consolidated work plan that brings together a range of these motions, um, noting that, as Councillor Lewis has quite rightly um, highlighted, some of these measures, such as um, you know protecting koala habitat, have you know long-range implications. So I think it could be useful and helpful if we can bring all of that back to council in a report um, with a you know multi-year work plan, so that you can actually see. Uh, the steps because um, uh, no doubt, or I, I suspect, maybe not, but uh, I, I suspect there could be some frustration that we have numerous outstanding uh, motions sitting on the, on the, the outstanding um, action items and it's not clear how they link together or what we're doing about those to, in, you know, to, to have that work program. So I'm, I'm keen to rectify that and bring it back in the next couple of months so Council can see a, a consolidated work program and see how we plan to address some of these actions, um, which you know, some we're doing right now, but some of them will flow into next year and, and years beyond. So I'm keen, keen to yeah, have visibility of that. You're good. Um, any other questions, councillors? Councillor, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, Mr Acting Mayor. Um, Councillor Hanson, th through you, Mr Acting Mayor, if I can just correct my last statement, that report will come to the June council meeting around the Burham town, but we expect to have a draft consultant's report back in May. We'll, we'll bring that to a briefing. Yep. Cool. Thank you, Keith. Um, Councillor Chapman. Uh, Councillor Hanson, can you pass the microphone here? Yes, um, just to the Director of um, Planning, the, I was just wondering if we could bring those to a round table pro, uh, for our planning meetings because uh, talking about uh, development and um, if we could make that a, uh, a gender item. Yeah, uh, through you, uh, Mr Hacking, May, definitely Councillor Chapman, I think that's a, a great idea, I'll make sure that happens. Thanks for that. Um, councillors, any other matters? Right, yeah, we'll put this one to the vote. So, all those in favour? Again, a, another unanimous decision from fire today. Um, right, yeah, 10.2.1, the quarterly progress report on the information of the 2018 to 2023 corporate plan and the 2018-2019 operational plan, um, which is on page 64 to 88. Uh, Councillors? I just have... Um a question? Maybe, maybe one question. It could be more. Um, in relation to page 68.3, um, it refers to conduct a review, review of local laws, and it's um, listed as a red light. Or, um, and it says there that the local law review project has been transferred to the governance team with uh, delivery intended for 2020. 21. Um, my understanding that this was one of those things that was going to be referred to the round table um, and is that what is referred to as the governance team or is there something else? Sorry. Uh, through you, Mr Acting Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Taylor. So uh, we will definitely have discussions at the round table, but that's not what it's referring to there. Um, sorry. Um, it's, it's referring to moving the responsibility uh, for conducting the entire local law review um, from the regulatory services team, which sits in the Development and Community Directorate, um, to the governance team that sits in the Organisational Services Directorate. So um, at the executive, we've had some discussions around this, and uh, obviously, Regulatory services are a key stakeholder in our local laws, and many of our local laws obviously are enforced by them. Um, but there's, there's a whole whole range of other departments across the organisation who uh, enforce local laws or have to comply with them. Um, and we thought it was more appropriate that that review was um, undertaken by governance um, than by the line agency. Yeah, and then. I'll make a statement that sounds like a question then, because I'm Scottish. Um, 74, page 74, um, development of a um, developed strategic and collaborative framework between Fraser Coast Tourism and Events and Council to support tourism growth. It refers to the deed of agreement review underway, mm -hmm. will be completed by June 2019. Um, will, 
if it's going to be completed by June 2019, who's uh, that? That's that deed agreement is um, approved by council, mm -hmm. um, and it was, I guess, formulated by, through council workshops early on. Mm -hmm. um, will that be the process, or will you just present a completed deed of agreement? Because my 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 hope would be that the council collective would be involved in. Uh, what would be removed or kept in that deed of agreement? Uh, again, through you, uh, Mr Acting Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Taylor. So uh, in terms of timing, we're obviously pushing up against that, that time frame, given the current agreement does expire in, in a couple of months' time. Uh, I received the draft of the agreement last week, uh, and I have a meeting scheduled with the, the CEO next week to, to brief him on the on the draft, um, and then I'd be looking to, to get it in front of council um, at, through a briefing over over the next next few weeks um, to to seek feedback on on the draft. But um, so who sent the draft? Like who who was it? Yep. Count, was it a council working document, or was it um, Fraser Coast Tourism Events that forwarded on to council for consideration? Yeah. Um, so, uh, councillor, it's 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 council staff prepared the draft. Yeah. Um, so they have spoken to you know uh, the management of Fraser Coast Tourism and, and Events, uh, but the draft is written by uh, our Economic Development Department. Yeah. And is it appropriate yet, considering the short time frame, for council to receive a copy of that draft now, or does it have to go through the executive management team first before we can receive that draft? Uh, through you, Mr Acting Mayor, um, I'd, I'd be happy to commit to get it to you within the next week or so. Um, just just uh, the, the only thing I, I, I really want to do before I do that is share it with the CEO when, in, when he's back on deck. Um, and I think I've got a meeting on Monday to, to share that with him, but um, I don't think there's yeah, any issues with passing it on very quickly. Councillors, any other questions, queries? Rightio. So we're looking for a mover. Um, the officer's recommendation on uh, page 64 is to receive a note the quarterly progress report for the period January to March 2019 as per attachment one and adopt the amendments to the 2018-2019 operational plan as set out in attachment two. So councillors, can I have a move for that one? Councillor Madden and a seconder, please. Councillor Hanson. All those in favour? And that's another unanimous. Well, she's from fire today, councillors. Um, item 10.2.2 .2 is the uh, appointment of a councillor to the audit committee. Um, the, the officer's recommendation there is on page 89. So, councillors, I'm uh, looking for a nomination. Councillor Madden. Um, Mr Acting Mayor, I would like to nominate Councillor Paul Truscott for this position. Oh, thank you, Councillor Madden. Councillor Truscott, do you uh, accept this nomination? I will gladly accept that nomination. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Truscott. Um, so the officer's recommendation that the, um, the council accept the resignation of Councillor Hanson as a member of the audit committee and appoint Councillor Paul Truscott to the council's audit committee for a period of 12 months in accordance with section 210.1 of the Local Government Regulation 2012 and the Council's Audit Committee Charter. So, nominations. Yes, I will technically ask. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was excited to get a nomination. Councillors, is there any other councillors who would like to put their hand up? Absolutely not. I think that sorts it out. <laughs> So, um, Councillor Madden, uh, will you move that motion? So that's Councillor Madden, moved by Councillor Madden and seconded by Councillor Lewis. All those in favour? All those in favour? Again? Yep. Thank you. That's carried again. Unanimously. I'm sure it will be a learned experience for Councillor Truscott. Um, item 10.2.3. 10.2.3 is the um, organisational performance report for March 2019 with the officer's recommendation on page 92. Councillors, any comment, questions? No. No. Councillors, can I have a mover for this motion? 
Councillor Chapman. A seconder, please. Councillor O'Keefe. Councillors will put this one to the vote. Oh, sorry. Um, Councillor Chapman, any comment? Okay, Councillor O'Keefe? No, all good. Right, yeah. all those in favour? And again, unanimous decision. Good. Item 10.2.4 is a councillor meeting attendance for May 2019. Can I ask a question about that before your <laughs> amendment, or do you? I just want to, it's up to you, yeah, it, it might be the same as your. Maybe you've got a concern about. It, I don't know, but um, through the chair. Yep. I, um, I, my understanding of the councillor meeting attendance report was to identify the meetings that all councillors were attending, not just specific ones. So here we've got. Um, uh, ones where, say, for example, um, single councillors are required to attend as part of a um, their, their commitment to a committee or a meeting. Um, I, I'm not sure that they should be in this. This is about the ones that councillors uh, uh, come and attend. For example, I mean, we've voted by resolution that um, uh, that um, Council Truscott is to a part of the audit committee, and by that resolution, he, he is now required to attend the audit committee meetings. Um, I don't know if we need to put it in here. My, my, my view is that it should be only for all councillor meetings, not for specific meetings. So, Director is just checking on the regulation. I'll just need to check. Okay, we'll just. I'm going to get there. Right, can you just give us one sec? We've yep, got an sure. internet a connection problem, as we have right across the Fraser Coast. Except for the showgrounds. Mr. Mayor, just reading, or Mr. Acting Mayor, sorry, just reading from the policy. Uh, the policy refers to in section three, as a general guide, meetings will only include those that have a formal council appointment or those that will involve all councillors for a strategic planning or policy purpose. When a meeting has been resolved by council is changed, the meeting no longer becomes a mandatory meeting. Uh, so my reading of that policy would indicate that both uh, meetings for which councillors are appointed and those meetings for which all councillors are invited are included. Well, that then creates a problem yeah. because um, round tables are appointed, appointed positions. Because they were specifically not part of the policy. And it was, it was the aspiration not to cover that in this. This is effectively to provide... Uh, like councillors that are on those meetings know what meetings they're required to attend. This was to remove amb ambiguity. Yes, sir. This was the the meetings that you refer to in relation to council law appointments are identified through the policy and through that appointment by resolution. So there's no uncertainty as to those. What this was to deal, deal with is to provide the uncertainty or provide certainty as to what meetings that the collective council should be attending so that it would be articulated in the meeting uh, in, in the agenda of the month before so that we would know to clear our schedule. Um, either the policy needs to be amended to take that out and just refer to all counts or we then need to start looking at all the other roundtable meetings which are also an appointment. My view is that this is specifically for all councillors. Uh, through you, Mr Acting 
Mayor and, and Councillor Taylor, thank you for your question. Uh, I'm, I'm reading from the policy. I, I concur with your assessment that round tables were excluded from that, and the fact that they're not on the list, um, I guess, indicates that you know we're not seeking a council resolution that they be uh, listed for mandatory attendance. But the ones that are uh, on that report, uh, the audit committee and the, the whatever the other one was, the traffic management committee uh, are listed there for mandatory attendance. Whilst it's it's arguably it? superfluous, um, I, I guess it's do you agree it's not incorrect. Policy would then it's really heavy, Michael. <laughs> do, you, do, do you agree that based on your reading of the policy that round table attendance should be recorded in this document? Uh, only if council resolves it. So if, if we are to put a motion there that the round table meetings are included in that list, then they would therefore become mandatory for those council laws that are appointed to each policy. But if they're not Can on the list... Can you reread that policy then? Because that... Okay, I'll start the meeting determination. For the purpose of this policy, Council will approve at each ordinary meeting of Council a list of meetings that are considered mandatory for councillors to attend for the following month. As a general guide, meetings will only include those that have a formal Council appointment or those that will involve all councillors for a strategic planning or policy purpose. Okay, so my, my question is, does, do roundtables have a formal appointment and, and well, they... We are appointed to them by resolution. Um, so each, there are two councillors, there was a resolution of council. Yes. So by reading that, even though it's our, maybe our desire not to have them recorded on here, the policy would indicate that they should be. Well, at at the end of the day, um, sorry, through you, Mr Acting Mayor, um, that council approve the list of meetings that are considered mandatory. So by not having them on the list, unless, unless a councillor wishes to amend the officer's recommendation to include the round tables, um, they're not mandatory. So the policy doesn't, um, oh, I guess it, it includes those meetings where councils are appointed, but it's council's decision which ones are decide, determined as being mandatory for attendance. So the policy doesn't imply that just because there's a formal council appointment, that it's a mandatory attendance. Yeah. The decision of council by this report on the agenda today determines that. But you've added in individual councillors on the basis of the policy and saying it's required to be in there because of that policy, but not putting in round table appointments because your argument is that it doesn't need to be in there unless it's resolved. So I'm, 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 I'm sort of, I feel like I'm chasing my tail or chasing yours. I'm not really sure. Could um, I have a the, the reason the, the reason the round tables weren't in there um, through you, Mr. Acting Mayor, is because I guess we were party to the discussions around the interpretation I of agree. the policy, yeah. and it was made clear uh, to the officers that round tables were not and, were not and, to be considered and, as and, mandatory. And that is why, when that discussion, I made the assumption that that included individual council councillor attendance by resolution as well. So it was only about the all council meetings, but I'll, I think I've said enough on this. And, and I was just going to make an observation about the difference between, um, say, a Wide Bay Water Advisory Committee meeting and a round table. In these committee meetings that are listed here, we actually uh, move resolutions and a report comes back to council to be also adopted and endorsed, whereas we don't do that with round tables. And I think to me, that is the significant difference between the two. Even though we're appointed to a round table, the round table doesn't provide formal meeting minutes back to the council meeting for adoption. Council so on that basis, I'd say, yeah. this is fine. I'd be happy with it. I was just going to make a similar point, uh, and I note that, uh, that the policy says, as a general rule, and I think that does give us a bit of wriggle room, um, it may be that we have to adopt uh, George Orwell's position on what constitutes a formal appointment, you know, that all appointments are formal if it's a resolution, but some are more formal than others, which is pretty much what uh, Councillor Madden is saying. Um, and so I, my view on it would be that while perhaps the, the policy isn't perfect in that regard, we can pick and choose in the way that this uh, resolution has done some uh, uh, formal appointments are matters where we will choose to make them a, a mandatory meeting 
some, such as round tables, are ones where we won't. Well, I'd be asking that the ones relating to individual councillors just be removed and we only have the all councillors in this one. And it's great that you've identified that you're a communist. Um, I'm glad to... <laughs> right, eh? Um, Did you hear him? You heard him? On the amendment, so... Yes. Yeah, okay. so, thank you for your patience, so, Councillor Light. Right, so, can I have a microphone, please, Councillor Light? Thank you. He's holding it. I, I put an amendment that uh, we exclude the meetings or cancel the meetings of the budget presentations on the 29th and 30th. I can speak to that before there's a second, or if that's if I get one. Um, the reason my methodology behind here is the mayor, it is the mayor's budget under the legislation. Uh, he is away on leave. I think it's important that obviously he is here. Um, I would also like to uh, flag that I'll be putting a um, a motion up at some stage to uh, uh, for this policy that I believe that a draft agenda should be present um, with some of these uh, these meetings. If it's that important, we should have a draft agenda. So I'm putting up an amendment that we take away from the officer's recommendation the meeting, the budget meetings on the 29th and 30th. Okie dokie. Yes, Councillor Lewis. Just a question. I, I'm not sure whether it's envisaged by this amendment that those meetings wouldn't be held or simply that they wouldn't be mandatory. I, I would suggest they're not mandatory. I can see no point having these meetings without the Mayor there. And we've already discussed the budget. The budget has had discussions. It is the Mayor's budget. He's made a very clear, uh, can we say, um, future vision of the budget and uh, I don't believe there's any um, need to have those two meetings. So my understanding is these two meetings, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Director, are so the staff come and present the operational side of the budget and we discuss any final amendments um, or adjustments to those? Yep. Oh. Uh, that's correct, Mr Acting Mayor. I'm, I'm just trying to find a, an email from, um, from our CEO who's on leave this week and my understanding is that he sought uh, clearance from the Mayor on continuing with those workshops uh, to keep the process of, of briefing Council on the content of the operational budget moving during his absence. Uh, there will be further workshops and briefings uh, with, with Council um, later in, in May and in June before the budget is finalised. Uh, Mr Acting Mayor, um, if that's the case then with that description for the Director, why was that description not put into this agenda? Uh, the, through you, Mr Acting Mayor, um, as I identified, I, I'm just trying to identify, my recollection is that the CEO had, had sent an email. I'm not sure if that was just to uh, to the executive or, or to all council, uh, but the, the purpose, the policy uh, determines that uh, the meetings are identified. At this stage, it, it's not required to provide uh, an agenda, but I think that's a good suggestion and we should um, we should include that. Um, yeah, well, Mr uh, Acting Mayor, I've put a, uh, an amendment up. I think it should uh, seek a seconder. Right, so your amendment will be to remove um, the, the meetings of the 29th and the 30th as mandatory attendance. Right. Councillor Taylor. Uh, to the, I guess to the CEO, by removing it from this um, report, does that then remove the obligation under state legislation which defines that council workshops relating to budgets are mandatory? Um, we, we can't, um, what I guess what I'm saying is it's not a case of us saying here that we don't accept them as mandatory and that will then circumvent the legislative requirement that has been legislated to say that these meetings are in fact um, uh, mandatory. What the purpose of this report is to flag to councillors under, with consideration of the legislation what the legislators would deem would be mandatory meetings. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr Acting Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Taylor. And um, I'm not entirely sure is, is the, the, the truth of the matter. I, I think the reality of the, 
the situation is that um, you know it is the mayor's budget, as uh, several councillors have, have highlighted. If if councillors were to determine that they didn't want these meetings to be mandatory meetings, um, I think we may need some further discussions because the question I would then ask is: Does council want us to reschedule those those meetings at a time? Um, uh, that is more appropriate, um, or are you know uh, councillors, I suppose, um, comfortable with us with going ahead and, and not having mandatory a attendance? Um, I'd also, you know, given it is the the mayor's budget, I'd, I'd think that it would be appropriate for us to seek some advice from the mayor about how he would want to go forward with that as well. Um, he may prefer to in that in that circumstance, if this this amendment was voted up, that we reschedule the the sessions. Um, but in terms of the specific legal uh, question you're asking about the interpretation of the legislation, I'm going to have to seek some advice and, and find out for sure. Well, maybe because it actually, I'm sure it says must must attend all budget meetings and workshops. So either we've got to cancel the meeting or it's mandatory. Yeah, so. So, well, and I suppose that's the. The question I'm grappling with at the moment, Councillor Taylor, is that if, if Council determines that it doesn't want these meetings to be mandatory, um, I think it's then appropriate for us to go back and you know seek some guidance from the Mayor if, if he wants us to reschedule those to, a, to an alternative time. So we'll seek some guidance from the Director. Uh, through you, Mr Acting Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Taylor. Uh, I'm just reading again from the uh, policy, which includes an extract from the Code of Conduct for councillors uh, and the standards of behaviour in the Code of Conduct outline uh, point one, that, that councillors will carry out their responsibilities conscientiously and in the best interests of council and the community. For example, councillors will, at a minimum, attend and participate meaningfully in all council meetings, briefings, relevant workshops and training opportunities to assist councillors in fulfilling their roles other than in, in exceptional circumstances and or where prior leave is given. So it doesn't make an explicit um, reference to budget meetings in the code of in the code of conduct. Yep, Councillor Chapman. Um, yeah, I just like the point of observation here is what the you, um, the LGAQ virtually said the other week down in Brisbane at their um, con convention they had down there is some of these policies that the state government have brought in have really not been thought out. What this is doing is putting an extra load on our community and uh, on our uh, council administration to organise meetings a month prior to, to when we're actually having them and then just going along with the general business of running a council. And what I'm saying is uh, us as councillors, as an observation, don't really need this extra load and we run our councils as we are instead of bringing all these rules and everything in instead of thinking about it before they do it. And um, I can see where the LGAQ are coming from when they're um, being asked about this. So just hang on, Councillor Madden, were you trying to find something? Or? Oh, yeah, but don't wait on me trying to find something because <laughs> my dealing with the internet and the web is very poor. Keep going. Okay. Um, councillors, my understanding was that a, a budget preparation was a, a mandatory meeting from, the, from my understanding of the Act. Um, we have a motion here from Councillor Light that re requires a seconder that, re uh, that he is seeking an amendment that will remove the meeting of the 29th and the 30th from the uh, policy, from the mandatory meetings list. I'll second that one. Righto, so Councillor Chapman will second that one. Rightio, so all those in favour of Council Lights? Yeah, sorry. For and against. Council Light, do you want to start this one off? Thank you, Acting. Is this on? Yes. Thank you, Acting Mayor. As I stated before, it's not so much the meeting itself, it's who's present at the meeting, and it's a key element. The DNA of the budget is the Mayor. Without the Mayor, I can't see the point of these meetings. Um, so, you know, it's written in legislation, it's the Mayor's budget and uh, he's entitled to leave, he's on leave, we all take leave, I'm not criticising that, but I think he should be present at those meetings. Speaker against, Councillor Taylor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Mayor. 
I do not support the removal of these um, these budget workshops. Um, I think out of all the meetings, they're probably the most important this month. Uh, it's not about um, whether or not the mayor is present. It's whether or not the um, the operational staff have been instructed well enough to provide councillors with feedback in relation to the budget and the decisions specifically relating to the decisions or, or discussions that we've had ongoing in relation to modelling and what it looks like. This is to help inform councillors on the Mayor's budget which is well in play. Um, for me to be able to make a decision on whether I'm going to support the budget, I need to be properly informed about the budget. It's not about whether the Mayor is present, it's whether I'm present to be able to be, um, be able to effectively understand the rationale behind some of the decision making and also uh, present my alternate views on some of those budget matters um, so that come budget day I can feel satisfied whether I vote for or against it. So in my mind, um, while I understand Councillor Light's position, I'm pretty eager to have my discussion with the operational staff in relation to decisions and directions that they've been provided to by the Mayor, who is currently on leave. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Are there any, speak, any more speakers for this motion? So then we'll vote on the motion. Right, yeah. So all those in favour of the motion? Oh, sorry. Do you want to write a reply, Councillor Lott? Uh, no, let's put it to the vote. Yep, right out. So, um, all those... The amendment. Yeah, for, for, right. for Councillor uh, Light's amendment. So, all those in favour of Councillor Light? Right out. So, we have three. And against. So, the amendment is lost in 7-3. Uh, or oh, 3-7, sorry. Rightio. So we go back to the original officer's recommendation. Um, so just seek a point of clarification on that one, on the meeting of the 30th or 5th for the audit committee that Councillor Truscott's name will be included in that one? That's correct? Yep. Rightio. Um, so if I can have a uh, councillor to move the motion that the council approve the meter, meetings required to be mandatory attendance for all nom for the councillors nominated for the period of 25 April 2019 to the 31st of May 2019. So that's councillor Sanderson. And seconded by councillor Madden. As per the officer's recommendation. Mr. Mr Mayor, now, now that there is a move and a seconder, I seek an amendment to remove the individual councillors and just refer to all councillor said, meetings. This is going to be an easy meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you understand my. So um, the meeting of the third of the fifth, the meeting of the eighth of the fifth, and the meeting of the thirtieth of the fifth uh, be removed. That's my amendment, and I'm seeking support from the mover in the second. So can you just read those dates again, please? The ones that relate specifically to individual councillors, and my rationale is in the same way that we um, tackle um, our um, roundtable appointments, which are properly appointed um, positions of council, um, we should deal with these in a separate way, um, and that's why I'd be seeking to provide that direction to council now, so the next time it comes, uh, we have some clarity on what's required. Thank you for making it as clear as mud. Um, mover, do you accept? Yes. Seconder? No. <laughs> <laughs> you earn your money today, Darryl. I was just thinking that. I'll second the amendment for the sake of discussion. Right, yeah. So, right, so now. Right, yeah, hang on. So if I can speak for the amendments. Just give me one sec. So we've got a mover is Councillor Taylor to amend the motion. Yep. And a seconder is Councillor Lewis. Councillor Taylor, you would like to speak to this? Yes. Um, in, in, in my mind, the reason we set down the council meeting attendance policy 
was to provide clarity on which meetings all councillors are required to attend. Um, it's not a case of providing a diarised, um, I guess, um, month so that we can know what all councillors are attending. It's specifically uh, to take away the, um, the confusion around which, uh, when councillors are required to attend an all council briefing, an all councillor workshop, all councillor training, or all councillor meeting. Uh, that was the purpose of it. Uh, when we discussed this in relation to appointments, and I note that, and I, I note that, round tables are an appointment of, by resolution of council, um, of which many of us attend um, and are members of. Um, and in my mind, if if you've got um, some of the advisory committee meetings that councillors attend being noted in here, then you should rightfully have. Um, round table meetings because I'm a strong advocate in round table meetings and I attend them um, but selfishly I should then say well why why aren't my attendance in those meetings recorded in this report as well um, at least to demonstrate that I'm attending some of those meetings as well so for my mind we decided to take those meetings out of this report and uh, in my understanding the collective view at that time was that it was specifically for all meet all councillor meetings, but now we have a situation where some councillors are being represented in these meetings because they're deemed to be appointed meetings, whereas there's more than these ones. So for me, the clarity um, needs to be um, stated by providing all council meetings only. Councillor Lewis. You don't have to talk. Just so, so you're not disappointed. Look, I, I understand the, uh, the uh, uh, usefulness of um, Councillor Taylor's submission. Um, I, I don't have a personal problem with having, uh, w with Council picking and choosing which of those meetings where there are only appointed councillors uh, to attend, but I do see the problem that it gets fairly difficult to know which ones they should be. I mean, meetings such as the Audit Committee, where, you know, which, which has a level of formality uh, beyond the uh, round tables um, and, and, and a, a level, I think, of legislative formality um, are perhaps uh, appropriate to include in this trying, notwithstanding that I have some reservations about, uh, along with Councillor Chapman, I have some reservations about the way uh, this stuff's put together. I, I think it, it, it needs... Uh, I mean, the, the very fact that we're debating this, you know, highlights the, the problems with the legislation. But uh, we, we need to work with it and I think in the spirit of that legislation, I'm, I'm actually comfortable with leaving in those more formal meetings such as the ones indicated here. I don't know much about the Traffic Advisory Committee and, and whether that has, for instance, the same level of formality as the uh, uh, Bay Water Advisory Committee uh, or the Audit Committee, but, but I, I'm, I'm comfortable enough to leave them in. Um, but on the other hand, I do see the benefit in uh, an, an approach which gives us an opportunity to, to to workshop this uh, in a bit more detail uh, and perhaps it is appropriate to pass uh, Councillor Taylor's amendment for the moment but look at the subject matter again uh, within the next month and, and see whether we need to do some tinkering with the policy. Thank you. Councillor Madden. I'm just contrary today. <laughs> <laughs> I want to speak against this because I do happen to think that the Committees as appointed under the Act, as the Wide Bay Water Committee and the, the um, Audit Committee have been appointed, have a special significance and I think there is a special onus on the councillors appointed to those committees to, to attend. Um, and I think the whole, pro the whole purpose of this legislation, whether you like it or not, is um, to indicate that councils are actually doing their job and doing it properly. I take the point about the round tables, but I don't think they're a committee of the same significance. Um, and on that basis, I, th I will have to vote against the amendment because I believe what is there is what is appropriate. Councillor Chapman, will you? Yes, councillors. Um, Officers, I just um, I have to vote against this too because I think that the um, uh, the 
like the TAC committee that we, um, we were able to make decisions in that um, meeting and it's all about our roads, our speed of our roads. Um, it, it, we, we have main roads that come in, uh, DTMR and uh, traffic, tra uh, TransLink. So there is, there is um, um, decisions made in those meetings. But I've, I also look at it and we talk about policies. This could all be covered under just one policy of, of meeting policy and we don't have to do this at every meeting to work out what meetings we should be going to and what we, sh we shouldn't be going to. And the other thing as I look at is Wide Bay Water, I look at the councils that actually attend the Wide Bay Water, the TAC committee and, and now the audit committee. Those councils, it's their, their duty to go to those committees because they put their hand up to say that they'll do the role. So um, I just think that um, this is half an hour we'll never get back in our life. Thank you. Make it 35 minutes. I haven't finished yet. Um, Councillor Taylor, your right of reply. Um, and and it, it, my, my issue, I think, has been stated, but I'll give you an example. Um, Councillor Light used to be on the audit committee and he was unable to attend a meeting and he asked me to step in as a proxy for that meeting. Now, that is a good experience for me, being able to participate in the audit committee and an opportunity for if, for example, Councillor Light had in that situation another obligation which he had to attend to, which he felt was important to attend to. Now, what this does is in that situation, for example, um, Councillor Everard and Madden, have now a new level of obligation to attend that meeting, whereas previously you could have proxies working in that space. So I guess for me, um, it's we are putting another level of obligation on councillors where they may feel as though they've got another commitment that they can attend to and get someone else to step in and get that experience. But now we're in a situation where um, we're isolating, highlighting and making it onerous on those councillors to make sure they have to attend those meetings. Um, and in, in my mind, it's clear um, there's, they're already appointed, there's a legislative requirement, uh, but uh, because they are specifically for individual councillors, not for all councillors, uh, as long as one council representative is there, we are complying with our requirement under the legislation and we shouldn't put more uh, put, put more, more of an onerous impact on one councillor to have to attend that meeting when there are, in fact, 11 councillors that can share the load. Councillors, that's all comment. Let's put this one to the vote. So the, we're voting on uh, Councillor Taylor's amendment, which is to remove um, the councillors from the meetings of the 3rd of the 5th the 8th of the 5th and the 30th of the 5th. So all those in favour of Councillor Taylor's amendment? All, all, all those against? Oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> you got the casting vote. Yeah, so um, the against have that one. I think that's the first time we've ever had one of those, isn't it? Oh, Jesus. Yeah, we've been one once. Yeah, good on this. So, are you gonna, have you identified where your casting vote will be? Yes, it's on the, uh, the against. I'm sorry, Councillor Taylor. Right, so we go back to the original motion, which was moved by... Um, yes, moved by Councillor Sanderson, <laughs> seconded by Councillor Truscott. Oh, sorry, Councillor Madden. Jeez, we've had that many... Excuse me for that, Councillor Madden. Radio. So all those in favour? So councillors, that's unanimous. Thank God for that. I was question unnoticed. Don't worry. Still wait for the mirror minute, aren't you? You lot. Right, our councillors, um, item 10.2.5, expression of interest for the Meribur City Hall floor. Law boards, that should read. We have an officer's recommendation that goes from 111 to 112. Rightio, council. So, so that's amended as per our discussion yesterday. Yep, so Councillor Truscott, you would like to amend, uh, move that one? Yes, 
Yeah, and Councillor um, uh, Chapman. Jeez, what else one was today? Um, Councillor Truscott, comment? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, I think that this is a great opportunity that uh, we were able to go out for this expressions of interest and it's great that there's been uh, a number of community groups, uh, nine in total, that have uh, applied for uh, some of these timber floorboards to be reused and have a second life for uh, various purposes throughout the Fraser Coast, including things like, yes, souvenir pens for uh, creating furniture and desktop items, uh, for timber flooring, uh, commemorative items. So it's, it's great to see uh, that something that was had such a great life in such a momentous place in Meribar will now get a second life. I think this is a great opportunity for those groups and I look forward to seeing uh, actual tangible items that they've come up with. Councillor Chapman. Yeah, good. Um, any other councillors like to comment? Rightio, so all those in favour? Again, we're another unanimous. Thank you very much, councillors. Um, rightio, 10.3.1, the conservation area policy, with the um, policy review, and the officer's recommendation is there on page 122. Um, Councillors, any comment or call for someone to move this motion? Councillor Lewis? Councillor Madden? Councillor Lewis, did you like to questions, comment? You don't have to. <laughs> In that event, I will. Uh, look, just a comment, uh, and uh, th this was a matter I, I mentioned in the... Uh, um, in the uh, briefing yesterday, uh, the, the policy does require that uh, uh, the um, ratepayer enters into an agreement under the Nature Conservation Act 1992, um, either a voluntary conservation agreement or a nature refuge agreement. My, my relative, relatively limited uh, experience, uh, but nonetheless I do have some experience with trying to negotiate uh, those sorts of agreements on behalf of clients in, in my uh, work as a lawyer. And there are some complications and there's a relatively low take up of those agreements because of the implications for the properties. Um, while I, I'm not seeking that we amend the policy at this stage, uh, it may well be that it's, it's worth our giving it some consideration in due course as to whether um, other sorts of agreements with council might suffice without the, the formality of an agreement under the Nature Conservation Act. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I, I think it's a, it, it, it's a good move that we um, maintain uh, our policy of uh, providing some relief from the general rate for those landholders who are prepared to set aside part of uh, their property for, for conservation. And uh, I would encourage uh, the landowners who may be in that position to, uh, to give it some consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Councillor Madden? No other councillors? So we'll put this motion um, that the council adopt the amended draft conservation area concession policy included in attachment one of this report titled conservation area concession policy review. Um, all those in favour? Now again, that's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Um, councillors, 10.3.2 is the Fraser Coast Smart Community Plan 2019 to 2023. And that's from pages 133 to 176, with the officer's recommendation on 134. <laughs> Councillor Truscott is going to move this motion. Um, Councillor O'Keefe, you second this motion? Thank you. Councillor Truscott. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Uh, just quickly, yeah, I, I think it's uh, great to see that we're making a mark to, to look forward to the future and, and what we can do through smart technology and what it can offer. Um, I've, I've expressed previously about some of my concerns about it, but I, I think overall, as we were saying in the briefing, that this is setting that groundwork and, and I really look forward to seeing how we can actually utilise the smart technology and, and really get a good hold of it and um, actually use what it's for to make it to make things easier and, and better for the public. 
Kev Thorne Keith. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. Um, I'd like to um, thank development and community for working on this plan. Um, the five year plan commits Council to being open to new technology opportunities um, and modernisation, uh, and I commend this report. Yeah, thanks, Councillor O'Keefe. Um, any other comment, Councillors? I'll just highlight 176. There's the, uh, an action, uh, a, uh, one of the dot points there, collaborating with business and existing industries. I think um, we've got some, we all know we've got some very innovative businesses on the Fraser Coast, so it would be great for Council to, to partner up with those guys going forward. Um, so we'll put this up with a recommendation that the Council endorses the Fraser Coast Smart Communities Plan 2019 to 2023. Uh, which will guide council into being proactive and agile when exploring and adopting new smart technology program, policies and programs. So, um, councillors, all those in favour? And that's carried unanimously again. Thank you. Councillors, um, item 10.3.3 is the Fraser Coast Recreational Vehicle Strategy uh, for March 2019. Um, and starts on... 177 goes through to pages 261 with the officer's recommendation on 178. So Councillor Truscott. Councillor Madden. Uh, Councillor Truscott. Thanks, Mr Mayor. I think that, uh, yeah, this is a great start as well. Uh, and I, it's good to see that this picks up on some of the, the older resolution as well that's still to be uh, brought back in... I think it's said in June, uh, at the June meeting, and uh, I look forward to seeing this happen. I think the changes that we made to RVs coming into Maryborough, particularly uh, at the Dune Villa site and the Allen and June Brown car park, have made a great difference in uh, in Maryborough in talking to the local business owners there. They're all over the moon about it. They think it's terrific. The uh, amount of extra, uh, the, the increased volume of customers that it's brought in through such a variety of businesses is overwhelming for them. So that's great to see and I, I look forward to seeing it continue to grow. Councillor Madden. Thank you. As someone who uses a caravan and travels around the country when she gets leave, um, I commend this report. I think where we started with the Alan and June Brown and the airport, no, which Doom Villa, that's the word I'm looking for, um, sites was a good step. I think this report and the processes around it is the next step to grow this industry. Uh, it is valuable for, for our community. Um, and, yeah, I, I think it's part of our overall tourism package and also part of our overall economic development package um, for our community. I think it's, it's vitally important that we move forward and this is the next step in the process of moving forward. It gives some formal processes around how we're going to do that. Uh, and I, I read all of the report, which is quite extensive. Uh, I thank the people that put their work into it and also the community for their contributions um, towards the development of that report. Um, councillors, Councillor Taylor. Uh, in relation to the officer's recommendation, I do not support it. Um, page 178, specifically uh, that council commence investigation to identify a suitable um, RV site which will replace the existing RV site located at the Harvey Bay Visitor Information Centre. I'm not going to um, go into more detail other than to say I've not supported free camping in the region. I think it's um, uh, counterproductive. Um, my view hasn't changed based on the report. Uh, so I will be voting against it. Any other councillors with comment? Um, well, I'll, oh, Councillor Lewis. I'd like to move an amendment uh, in, in relation to, uh, uh, specifically in relation to the matter that Councillor Taylor has, uh, uh, has uh, um, drawn our attention to and I'm just formulating the amendment as I go but I, the amendment would be to add um, at uh, um, the end of section 2 of that recommendation um, provided that uh, this resolution does not commit the council to uh, uh, proceeding uh, with any alternative 
RV site in Harvey Bay without further resolution. You accept that? Yeah. Both mover and second have accepted that one. <laughs> just just uh, one, one second. Um, excuse me, Marlene. Did you get that? Would you like cancel it? Further in. And the second round of the move was second, I agreed to it. Yeah. So, just one, just one sec, um, Councillor Chapman. Right. Um, sorry, Councillor Chapman. Yep. Yes, uh, Acting Mayor. I'd actually like to speak against that motion. I just think that um, by not um, going ahead with um, looking at a, an alternative site, it just saying that, okay, we're not going to look at an alternative site, that's what. That's what we're virtually left with. No, I don't believe that's what we're saying. We're looking at Hang on, um, Councillor Madden, Councillor Madden. Microphone. Sorry. Oh, right. Sorry. I believe, unless I've got it wrong, that the amendment is not stopping us from looking at an alternative site in, Har in Harvey Bay. It's just that we don't commit to anything further until it comes back to Council for a further decision. Long. So... If we're not looking at anything, how do we actually get something to come back to council so no, we can make a decision on it? We are looking at it, but we're not committing to doing the work until it comes back to council. That's my understanding of the amendment. Is that right, David? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So I've just got a, a question for the acting CEO. I guess it's the acting CEO who I'll direct this one to. Um, policy on non-self-contained vehicles in sites de designated for uh, self-contained vehicles, what will our compliance policy look like and how will we enforce it? Uh, through you, Mr Act Acting Mayor. Um, uh, it, it's a good question and, and the reality is that all of our compliance activities are, you know, by and large, you know, soft touch compliance activities. So um, we, we visit RV sites. Um, you know, we visited over the, the Easter weekend. We had uh, staff rostered on going to a whole range of places where people traditionally uh, camp or um, uh, where, where they shouldn't be. Um, our, our first approach in those circumstances, though, is always to encourage people to comply with the rules. Um, and it would be the same in, in, in these circumstances that you know we would be we would be encouraging people to comply with the rules. Um, you know we obviously have our our, our our powers that we can use in terms of um, uh, forcibly moving people off or issuing pins um, on occasions if they are breaking local laws. Uh, but we try and avoid that wherever we possibly can. Um, there's a comment in, in the report, which is a pretty detailed report, around the CMCA um, and offer by those guys to manage a site. So I'm, I'm just not sure what the... Would that be for their members... I suppose this is a question or notice. Would that be for their members only? So they've offered to manage a site on the Fraser Coast. Um, so there's that one. Um, and also in the report, um, I thought we may have got an indication of the number of vehicles or the number of users of free sites who actually went on to commercial sites. Um, I know over the, the course of the, the discussion around uh, this topic, there's always been that, that comment that, yeah, um, um, that users of free parks also use, um, go into paid accommodate or paid sites, but I, look, I just struggled to find that in there. And then, um, if on page 193, it says 71% spend um, of spend most of their nights in non-commercial style, and then 30% of them avoid commercial um, sites. So I just like I thought there might have been in the in the report some type of indication on what the numbers the transition is from free to paid while they're with us. I'm not sure if that's a question or a statement. It's been a long meeting. <laughs> Can I? Sorry. Uh, Yes, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Acting Mayor, and uh, thank you for the question or uh, 
statement. I, I took two questions from it, so I'll try and answer them both as best I can. Uh, the CMCA issue, so their, their general model, um, where I've seen them operating before at uh, Ingham, uh, is f as members only parks. Um, so that's how I've seen them operating. Uh, the reality is if we were to seek to enter into an arrangement with them, um, you know, th those kind of lease details would need, need to be worked through. So, there, there, you know, there is potential that council could seek um, to try and develop a different arrangement, but that's not how they've done it, done it so far. Um, in terms of the data, uh, the, I suppose... I, I appreciate the concern with the the quality of the data. We have we have sourced lots of data for this report, or you know the, the people working with us have. Um, it is a very contested space, though, and the data is murky um, at, at best. There's there's lots of different data sets which uh, seek to represent the the same thing but tell very different stories. So you do have to read between the lines in some of that that stuff. Um, the specific question about you know the, the people who move from uh, free to paid parking sites that often happens across region as well. So it could be that someone stays in a free park here and then moves on to you know Gladstone or Rockhampton and might spend a night in paid accommodation or vice versa. Uh, people may use free facilities in other regions and then when they get to our region, um, it might be the the time that they you know want to have a good shower or, or use some facilities. So, so some of that is 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 hard to, to know, hard to interpret. Um, you know, we do look at the data that the caravanning industry gives us as well as the, the, the RV groups. Um, and, you know, it's fair to say that there's, there's wild, wide divergences in, in, in what that data says. Councillor Madden. I'm a caravanner. <laughs> I have to tell you, I, I, and having known in this process that we were looking at RV camping, and this has been going on for a number of years. I have been very, very consciously looking when I go on leave and go on a holiday to see what is happening out there to try and bring back some information which is hopefully as unbiased as possible, so fair and reasonable. Um, and I believe that there are significant numbers of free campers who do use paid caravan accommodation. It, it, it's, it's a reality of actually trying to camp in a self-contained van. You have got to get water after about three days because you simply can't carry in more than that. Um, you have to manage um, the um, toilet facility, so you have to have a dump point. Now, sometimes you can get these things without actually going into a caravan park, but a lot of, a lot of places you can't dump points are in caravan parks and they don't let you just roll in and, and dump without actually paying. So there's a whole gamut around it, but I think you'll find there are significant numbers of people who actually free camp maybe sometime, but they actually use caravan parks because they need those facilities. So um, you're never going to get that data though because caravan parks by nature are commercial ventures and all of that information is going to be commercial in confidence to them you may be able to source it alternatively, but that's one of the things that this report addresses is the lack of hard data and how do we go about getting it. Councillor, any... Councillor Keith. Yeah, um, yeah look, I, I, I uh, uh, support the um, officer's recommendation that Council endorse the Fraser Coast um, RV strategy. And I note that um, the report is to guide and not decide future growth. Um, in the industry, and I think that's a critical point here. Um, I think the report allows us to respond to changes in the market, um, and I commend the report. I have a question. Councillor Taylor. So the report refers to um, the Harvey Bay sides, but in the recommendations on 253... So that's in the report, 253? Page 254 of the, um, of the agenda item page and 31. And it refers to... Um, uh, it refers to overflow. It says um, where there are no vacancies available at all existing caravan parks within council areas, including approved overflow sites within the licensed caravan pack, council may authorise um, 
may authorise. That's not the right section, is it? Is that council may establish an overflow area for RVs only where there yeah. is no vacancies for vehicles of this nature at any caravan park within the relevant town. Yeah. So how does that how does that sit with it? How does the actual recommendation or the the, um, the recommendations in the report and the report itself lend to that second limb of the um, office recommendation to? Um, find an alternate site in Harvey Bay? Uh, through you, Mr Acting Mayor. So uh, the, the section you're referring to, Councillor Taylor, is I understand from the state government's uh, uh, camping options toolkit. Um, so uh, th that is a, a piece of advice which the state government has compiled uh, for councils right across the, the region. Originally, they were focused more on councils using showgrounds, as a lot of councils do for, for overflow. Um, and the, the guidance they gave around that is that there should be some mechanisms in place to only open up those facilities um, at times when your private caravan parks were full. Um, so that's the, this, on that page 31 or two, 254. Part of the final report. Yes, yes. Um, so that's that is actually from 251, I think it is, um, the best practice basis for, for management options. So that's... So let me, I guess, re, let me reword my question. In the Fraser Coast Regional Council Recreational Vehicle Strategy, final report, March 2019, makes a number of recommendations. Which one of those recommendations led to the resolution, um, the motion, the um, officer's recommendation, limb number two. Okay. Uh, we, we are. We're talking. We're talking about the, it's. It's the state government's um, gu guidance, which was was referred to in it. But um, the. the I'm going to have to actually go through it and find specifically where it is in the report, but. It's probably worth me. I suspect councillors know, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure because I haven't wasn't here when this project commenced. But the, the current facility um, already exists, as I understand it, at the the tourism uh, information centre. Um, and the feedback that came through the report and the recommendation is that we look for an alternative to that site because uh, the the advice and the feedback came that that site is not um, working well. Um, so it's seeking to, essentially, that recommendation is seeking to find an alternative to what already exists um, because the feedback was that that wasn't working. Um, and, and that's, so what you're saying is that this final report mm -hmm. led to the conclusion that we needed to amend uh, or move the site from its current location to a new location. Yet when I read the recommendations of the report, there is not one reference to that. And that's what I'm trying. If if that were one of the most significant recommendations of the report, why isn't it captured in there? Uh, the director of uh, White Bay Waters just referred me to page two nineteen, but I'll just uh, need to read that, councillors. Yeah, so if you look at uh, page 219, councillor, or page 34 of the report uh, under the recommendation effective site management and development as a, a driver of stakeholder and customer satisfaction, um, it basically says that the numbers are fine, um, but with specific regard to the Harvey Bovic location, this site has been identified as being uh, not fit for purpose. Uh, with a new and more appropriate site being necessary. Um, and also further goes on to say we should do annual needs assessments.
Councillor uh, Councillor Chapman, sorry. Yes, uh, acting me. The um, I just look at this uh, caravan strategy. Is it's virtually a must that we we move forward with it. Is um, one of our major incomes around this region is tourism, and the way that the baby boomers are always there, uh, the number of caravans that the baby boomers are in, um, travelling the country, looking around, enjoying themselves on their retirement. That's where we've got to look at. Um, is we've got to be able to capture that money and get those people in. Just sitting here at the moment and looking out the window, watching the number of caravans heading north, is it just incredible when we're talking about it? Um, probably every every fourth vehicle's got a caravan on behind it. So um, they're the things that we've we've actually got to do. We've done this amount of work. We've still got to do a lot more work on making sure that that we can attract those caravanners into our region for our economy because uh, it is a major part of, there's a lot of tourists on the road towing their own caravans. Councillor Taylor, hey, how's it reading? Um, I think you've answered my question. You bet. I don't, I don't, I don't think it actually... Microphone, mate. I, I still don't. I, I, th I don't think it actually makes that recommendation. It goes into a needs assessment, um, but nonetheless, there's some reference to it. Uh, thank you. So well, I just need to clarify this one. So we've had an amended motion that's been put forward, that's been accepted by the um, well, the mover and seconder. So please excuse me. So councillors will put this motion. The officer recommendation on 178 is that council endorse the Fraser Coast Recreational Vehicle Strategy as attached in this report to guide the future growth of the RV visitation and tourism in the Fraser Coast. Point two, the council commence investigation to identify a suitable Harvey Bay RV site which will replace the existing site located at the Harvey Bay Visitor Information Centre provided that this resolution does not commit the council to another RV site without a further resolution of council. And point two, Three, that this report be tabled in the June 2019 ordinary meeting addressing the Council's previous resolution, um, Resolution 5 of Item 10.1.5, Review of Camping Stakeholder Strategy of the Council Minutes from the meeting of the 28th of September 2016. Deary me. Are we clear, councillors? Glad someone is. Rightio. All those in, I'll put this motion. All those in favour? Against, that's carried 9-1. Yes, Councillor Madden is leaving the room and it's 11.38. Councillors, um, item 10.3.4, Councillor Madden has left the room at 11.38. Um, expression of interest in the new Fraser Coast Administration Centre. Uh, in the Meribra CBD, um, the office recommendation is there on page 360 on page 363 that the council confirm that it is in public interest to undertake an expression of interest process for the new Fraser Coast Administration Centre to be developed within or close proximity to the Meribra CBD, uh, as depicted in Figure One of Council Report Expression as of Interest New Fraser Coast Administration Centre Meribra CBD. Point two, that council approves the expression of interest document as attached to this report, um, expression of interest, New Fraser Coast Administra Administration Centre, Meribra CBD, for the calling of expression of interest. Um, this is being moved by Councillor Truscott, seconded by Councillor Sanderson. Um, comment, Councillor Truscott, Councillor... Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. Uh, yes, I think this is a great opportunity to find out what is out there. Uh, I, I know that uh, just from talking amongst the community over the last couple of months, while this has all sort of been 
uh, a bit out there that there's been a lot of interest as to what could happen. There's been a heck of a lot of suggestions come forward. And so I think it's great that this is going into a formal process now so that people will be able to uh, genuinely put something in if they do have uh, interest or suggestion. And I look forward to seeing what could be done out of the, uh, the options there that have been suggested. Um, in uh, point two of the report there. So I think this uh, has great potential and uh, look forward to seeing what this can do for the Maribor CBD. Thank you, Councillor Truscott. Councillor Sanderson. Um, any other councillors? So we'll put this motion. All those in favour? So that's uh, another one. So that will be unanimous, or have be nine. Yeah, still unanimous, sorry for that. Um, could someone please Get Councillor Madden for us. Thanks. Councillor Madden's back in at eleven forty one. Councillors, item 10.3.5, um, which is the application for material change of use for extractive industries and operational works for vegetation removal and clearing of native habitat um, at Gillies Road and Pyalba Barham Head Road, Roads, Barham Heads. Welcome, officers Brennan and Burke. Um, Councillor Chapman, you'd like to move this one? A uh, seconder for this, please. Thank you, Councillor Light. Councillor Chapman, would you like to comment on this one? I'll wait. I'll hold my right reply and wait for the officers. Oh, hang on. Right on. Is Councillors, any questions for the officers? You don't have to speak. I, I'm. Thanks, uh, Mr. Acting Mayor. Um, it gives me great pleasure to ask a question or two on this issue. Look, it's a, it's a serious uh, matter uh, and uh, uh, there's been a lot of submission in relation to this application uh, from a variety of people, including people who are very well versed in uh, matters ecological. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether the officers might make some comment on uh, the, the, the overall impact of uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, loss of habitat, uh, um, in, in particular the Wallum froglet uh, habitat, which is referred to in the report, um, and, uh, and just perhaps comment on what the options might be for council, given uh, noting that the, the state government conditions require either a 15, uh, 15 hectare um, offset or alternatively presumably some monetary compensation um, and in asking this question I just want to you know, draw the attention of everyone to the fact that the um, Environment Advisory Committee has been seeking um, has been asking council to look at the possibility of a linkage across this property between the um, um, Burham National Park to the north and council-owned environmental land to the south. So I'm just wondering whether there's uh, whether we can get some comment from the officers on any options that that might be available um, were this uh, development to proceed to uh, uh, secure some land within the Fraser Coast region as opposed to elsewhere in the state uh, pursuant to that state government condition. Um, Emily, can you to the microphone? Oh, oh no, sorry. Just... Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, as you're aware, the state government conditions do require for the prior to any commencement of works in stages five and six, and the applicant to enter into an agreement relating to an environmental offset. Um, in with respect to council's role. Look, I don't know that council has any role in the, um, in being able to influence 
um, the, the future agreement. Um, I have this morning spoken to the applicant or the planning consultant on behalf of the landowners. Um, they haven't been able to speak with the landowner or the, the project manager uh, as he is away. Um, this, I, we raised the suggestion of a possible you know, connection or some future, uh, I mean basically the future use of the land after an extractive industry use would cease. Um, the consultant was suggestion was that if council was to enter into discussions with um, the applicant, they felt that that would occur after the extractive industry operation had was complete, which is obviously well into the future. Um, I guess in terms of the application at this stage, the decision period ends today. If council doesn't make a decision, what that would mean is a, a deemed refusal under the Act. And I mean, that doesn't mean that it is a refusal. It's just that the applicant would have the option to um, lodge an appeal in the Planning and Environment Court on that deemed refusal. Um, I don't believe that's what the option they would necessarily take up. Um, the advice I'm receiving from the applicant is that they're just um, seeking to get an approval at this stage. Um, we haven't, till, till today, raised the possibilities of, um, of council seeking um, either the land or an access to the adjoining national park as part of this process. So we can't, really, can't necessarily comment because it hasn't been raised specifically with them. But as I've previously mentioned, there was um, a discussion saying, you know, by the applicants in the past that um, they, I don't think they have a huge use of the land other than after they've exhausted the extractive industry operation on the site. Um, Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and if, this is just a follow-up question. I, I, I'm conscious of the fact that in the ordinary course, a landholder will will want to be able to utilise his land for some purpose or other. I mean, ov obviously, uh, he'll want to be able to derive value from it, and, and that's of course the balancing uh, issue which councils are confronted with uh, daily in, in, in the planning space. Um, I'm wondering, and this is perhaps a bit unfair because I haven't flagged it with you, but uh, I'm just wondering whether there are any other use options for land like this, bearing in mind that it's zoned rural and bearing in mind that the habitat uh, constraints, are there any other land options or land use options um, which would be less uh, deleterious to, uh, to the uh, habitat and the issues that are raised in the report concerning those, bearing in mind that, that obviously there have been um, some serious concerns about, um, uh, about the uh, the development. I mean, to put it at its highest from, from, say, a submitter's point of view, the very best use of this land from an ecological point of view would be no development at all. But I appreciate that that um, sets at naught uh, a landowner's entitlement to utilise his property. So I guess my question is, are there better uses for this land, given its zoning or given its potential zonings, uh, than uh, a use as uh, uh, perhaps uh, intrusive as extractive industry? Thank you. Um, through, through the chair, um, the the one use that they could conduct essentially without a without a permit under the planning scheme would be a nature based tourism activity, um, and that would be a low scale camping activity. They would um, they look. I haven't double checked the planning provisions. However, there's a code, um, and provided they comply with the code, and I think. Um, they have to provide an on-site facility. I mean, they can have the self-contained recreation vehicles without a facility, without any on-site amenities. But if it was a camping option, then um, they would have to provide those facilities. But and then they'd have the options to provide the the camp kitchen type as well. But that would, you know, could virtually operate in a limited space and. Um, so that would be one option for the site. And I think one of the submitters actually raised that as a. As a, why does the applicant not propose to use the site for that purpose? But I guess council has to assess the application that is submitted to us. Yes, thank you very much. It's a question um, about procedure here. 
um, maybe to the CEO and to the directorship of this area, is the officer mentioned, and all respect to the officers, but the, and I might need to clarify this, is that, that if we don't have a decision today, it's an automatic refusal, is that correct? Um, through the chair, it's defined as a deemed refusal under the Act. I mean, I did seek an extension to the decision period from the applicant today, but, I mean, he didn't speak either way to that. Um, so, I mean, it is... I mean, we could secure an extension today still. It is still the current business day, so um, we haven't at this point. But that's right. I mean, it's... Yeah. I don't know how risky it is. It's not... It's fairly yeah. low risk. Um, we are, um, through you, Mr Acting Mayor, to um, uh, Councillor Light, it's probably conscious just not councillors know because they've read the report, uh, but we are recommending an approval as well. So uh, essentially it does open up a risk that, you know, potentially we... Uh, it could play out through that process that we issue a deemed refusal, the applicant uh, appeals that, and we're going to court to uh, litigate a matter that we're actually recommending an approval for. Um, so there, there are, are some risks around that, as uh, the officer has highlighted, though. It, it is, um, the process is applicant-driven. They could grant an extension if they wanted to. If, if council weren't comfortable making a decision today, um, the applicant could grant, grant as an extension. Um, uh, but there's, obviously we are recommending approval. So my concern is, is that councillors, we have a right, a number of different avenues to go. One would be to defer it, to lay it on the table, whatever. Um, I'm very concerned, and this has happened previously uh, in this council, um, that we are limited by our rights because of the timing of this matter to the agenda. And I'm very concerned about that. Um, it does limit our ability to make those other decisions um, and want for a better terminology puts a little bit of a gun to our head um, and uh, I wish to express to the Acting Mayor and to the Acting CEO and that Director, uh, I'm very concerned about that this matter wasn't brought to a previous meeting, so we didn't have those limitations placed on us. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, just if, if you indulge me, uh, Mr Acting Mayor, uh, appreciate those comments and um, uh, Councillor Light and uh, I, I think going forward we need to try and find a way to get these kinds of issues on briefing agendas because the challenge, um, and again, you know, we've had some discussions about state government decision making early on in, in the meeting today, that we're at the end of the process and they set very tight time frames for us in terms of our decision making. That's not an excuse in the sense of we have other mechanisms to be able to bring matters to councillor's attention um, you know, in advance of the actual council meeting agenda and we'll have to yeah, think about doing that better in the future. Councillor Madden. Yeah, I was actually just going to refer back to Councillor Lewis's comments or questions about you know, what's an alternative use. When you're a landholder, the highest and best use is what you can most money you can generate out of the property legally under the town planning. And obviously the landholders here have decided that the best value for this, that they're going to generate income out of this property, is for an um, um, extraction industry for which they have paid significant money in terms of town planning um, consultants, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to go through this. So while I take your point, Councillor Lewis, about wanting a less impactful um, use of the property, uh, that's fine if you're a philanthropist and can afford it. But if you're looking to maximise the income from a property and maybe provide an inheritance for your kids, um, then this is obviously at this point its highest and best economic use and will give you the highest and best value on your capital property and I say that as a property valuer. Officer Brennan. Uh, through the Chair, uh, just for awareness purpose, councillors, the application has a, a concurrent agency referral which is for the state relevant to matters of ecological significance. Yep. Because there's MSES across the site, these issues that have been raised by yourself, um, Councillor, are really from the state's perspective of their interests. Uh, our ability to actually um, present something that may be differing 
to their actual response as conditions because uh, they've recommended an approval uh, for the actual proposal. So if we actually put something forward that is contrary uh, to them, is the ability to do so isn't actually available uh, because it is like a joint approval process, state and local. Thank you. Thank you, Geoffrey. Um, Councillor, oh, sorry. Emma? Well, just through the chair also, um, Councillor Lewis um, mentioned about rehabilitation. And I suppose what I could say about the, the state responses are they are quite strenuous, the requirements that the state is imposing on the applicants relating to they have to do extensive groundwater monitoring, surface water monitoring, um, if in the event of acid sulphate soils reporting, um, flora management plans, fauna management plans. Um, I mean, there's a condition in there that requires 12 months of groundwater monitoring before they even go on the site so that they can down the track demonstrate that there are no adverse impacts to groundwater monitor, you know, to the groundwaters and to the wetlands and... So there are quite strenuous conditions on the application um, for them to even commence. There are also, as we've discussed, the um, requirement is, and yes, in the medium term, they will be, for those stages one to four, it will not be rehabilitated. However, in the longer term, those stages one to four are required to be backfilled to the same, the pre-clearance levels. So essentially, in, in due course, those stages will, want, will achieve the required... They will uh, achieve what is basically there at the moment. And there's requirements in, their, in the condition relating to preparation of a rehabilitation plan that they do have to conserve the topsoil in the hope, in the hope that the, um, the existing seed bank will re-establish once the rehabilitation occurs. There's also a requirement that if, that if that seed bank doesn't work, they have to present other options of planting for, yeah, to replace those, um, replace the plants that haven't regenerated as part of that process. So the, um, yeah, and I guess, and as we're aware, there's going to be a large new additional water body being introduced to the site. The final design of that is subject to conditions as well to ensure that um, any overland flow waters from there don't, you know, introduce pest species and things like that. So there is, I mean, I think it's, it is, but this one as well, it, it really is about ensuring that there's compliance to the conditions. Um, will be there. Uh, no, it's back to you. I was going to give a rod of reply to Councillor Chapman. Yeah, look, thank you. Um, and I appreciate all the work which the planning staff have done in relation to this matter and, uh, and for that matter, the, the state government authorities. Um, certainly, this is a much better proposal than it might have been and it's a much better proposal uh, than it was when it first came many years ago when, it, when an earlier proposal was put forward. It's a much smaller footprint and, and I, I had noted those various things which uh, Ms Burke refers to. Um, the land would serve the community better without this development. Uh, and I, while I understand uh, any value will say, get whatever you can, that's, that may well be um, the, the, the purpose of, uh, or that may well be the goal of a landowner uh, concentrating on, on accumulating his fortune. It's not, of course, the role of the council necessarily to approve the, the, the highest and best use especially if it has significant adverse impacts uh, on the ecology. Um, this, this does trouble me a great deal. In the end, I will we'll vote in favour of it because uh, to do so, to do uh, uh, otherwise would be to uh, oppose our office's recommendations and the recommendations of the state government and I think expose us to what would probably be a losing uh, uh, battle in the uh, planning and environment court. So I'll, I'll vote in, in favour of it on that basis uh, and, uh, you know, with deference to the, the good work which our uh, staff have done. It doesn't, however, enthuse me and I think it uh, does highlight the need for the community to secure as much as it can of this uh, highly valued habitat land. Thank you. Yeah, I hope they haven't retired yet. Sorry, Councillor Lewis. Uh, it's Councillor Taylor. Yes. Um, 
I will be uh, speaking against this recommendation, uh, not because of the work that the officers have done. I think they've done a tremendous job. Uh, but their role in this decision-making process is an objective one and one that lays reference to the planning scheme and the um, state um, uh, legislative requirements and can, things to consider and how to best um, consider the, uh, the application on, those, uh, on its merit on those issues. Um, I believe that there is also another test and that's why it comes before an elected body of the community, and that's a subjective one. Uh, this, in my mind, is something that I very, I very, I'm very reluctant um, to take on when an officer makes a recommendation in, in such a way and articulates their response so professionally. But when I consider, um, particularly when you look at the the statement from the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service that this, um, this site is nestled in a very special place, uh, an environmental place of significance. To me, subjectively, I have to ask myself what is the risk to our natural environment and habitat? Um, is there a risk? Uh, yes, in my mind there is subjectively. Um, is the risk too high for me? to vote in favour of the officer's recommendation? The answer is yes. So for that reason, while I support the officer's work, I have to subjectively vote against this recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Um, councillors, no other comment? Councillor Chapman, write a reply. Thank you, Mayor and Directors. Um, my right of reply is going to take a different, um, different look at this. This is all about getting sand out of the ground. And this is all about a, someone that wants to make a business within our region. They've got their own land. They've gone through the hard yards with dealing with the governments. Got, they've got all the policies and everything's all been put in, all the guidelines and everything's been put in front of them. So, so here we are. We're saying that this council is proactive in getting the economy moving and everything like that. One of the things we need in our economy, if we're going to grow to, um, in 2030 to another 50,000 people within this area, is one of the things we're going to need is sand. Sand underneath houses, underneath slabs and everything like that. So when you look at this site, this site is around about 5% of the whole site. And when you look at the, the way that the uh, banks here and everything regrows, it regrows very quickly. And I've actually been up to Cancuna where they're doing a lot of sand mining around the, in the Cancuna beach and seen the rehabilitation areas up there. And you wouldn't know that they've actually sand mined some areas the way that the growth has actually grown back. So I just think that this has uh, been uh, well drilled by the, the government. Um, we've just got to make the uh, decision now on um, to let this business move forward. We... There has been a uh, sand just in Drew's Lane. That used to be a, uh, an extraction area for sand. Now that's been shut down. These things are gonna keep moving out, moving out, and moving out as, as we grow. And um, so I feel that uh, I will be voting for this and, uh, and I will be supporting a new industry, someone new to start up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chapman. Councillor Light, you're all good. Um, councillors, we'll put this motion as per the officer's recommendation on page 275. Councillors, all those in favour? And against? So the motion's carried 9-1. Thank you, councillors. Uh, thank you, officers. Councillors, item 10.4.1, uh, um, Riverhead's boat ramp car park, timed parking. Um, this is on agenda pages 343 to 346 with the officer's recommendation on 343 and 344. Councillors, any questions? Not game. Sorry, so Councillor Madden. Rightio, and seconder, I'll second it. Councillor Chapman. Do you want to put your name on the media release? 
Can I? Um, Councillor Madden. Oh, sorry, any questions, councillors? No, Councillor Madden. Please. I'm just going to say that this is one of those very, very difficult decisions that elected members have to make, and they're probably a no win. I'd say you'll have people on one side saying you're not doing it enough, and people on the other side saying you're doing too much. And if we hammered from both sides, then we've probably got something that's in the middle and appropriate. <laughs> um, Obviously, something needed to be done. Let, let's have a go at doing this. Let's see how it works. Let's monitor it over a period of time. Um, and then, if necessary, come back and have another look at how it's working. Circumstances may change in the time and then things may look differently. And noting that, there will be more car parking available up on the top of the hill in the future. Thank you, Councillor Madden. Councillor Chapman. Yes, I'd, like, I'd actually like to put an amendment to this that we actually get a, um, a report back with, say, in three months' time um, on how it's, as it's been monitored, to bring it back to council just to let us know how it's actually working, if it is working or it's not working. Because sometimes you see these uh, things that actually the council change and it may not be working out there and we just stick there and we just keep going with what, with what we've changed and it, I'd actually like it to come back to council to see what has actually happened. So, um, so oh, sorry, Councillor Chapman. I'll just point out on page three forty three um, in the executive summary it says this is considered to be an intern solution. As there are a num number of proposals to increase parking for the facility uh, currently being considered by council. So, if I'm correct, this will be a, a trial office uh, directed Nadu. For how long? Is Oh, sorry. Um, th through the chair, um, this, um, as I said, you know, in the in the report, it's an interim solution. Um, um, as you are aware, Councillor Chapman, that um, we are looking at uh, extending the car park on top of the hill there. Um, so um, this will be um, until um, we have another um, car park or the car park extension completed. So. Um, we're happy to monitor and, and, and provide something back to council. I'm not really sure what level of monitoring um, would be needed. Um, you know, um, there will be another level of resources committed there to go and um, enforce um, and you know capture the data. So um, you know, um, we, we we will be doing um, some level of monitoring to understand how effective this um, timed parking would be. Um, just to have an understanding. So once the new car park is um, done on the top of the hill, um, we might have to review that at that stage, um, you know, depending on what the um, pressures are. Thanks. Yes, yeah, through the chair, the director. Um, yeah, what, I don't uh, want uh, extra staff to go out and monitor it and, and everything like that, but we will have staff. You have to, if you set a law, like a rule, You've got to have staff to monitor that. So what I wanted was a bit of feedback on what the um, what that's and maybe we can just do that in house anyway at a briefing meeting or something like that. But um, I'd still like it to come back to council as to see what we're actually implementing. Is it working or isn't it working? Uh, acting CEO, that might be one for you to to ponder. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just wrote myself, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Mayor, I just wrote a, th a third leg um, if Council wanted to consider a, an addition to it, but I think we can bring it back via a, um, a briefing, a Monday briefing, and just make sure that we, um, you know, keep a close eye on it um, and, and report back to councillors in, in a few months' time about the interim measures, um, but also about the longer term measures. Yeah, all good with that, Councillor Chapman? Good with it. Yep, no worries. Uh, so, councillors, so on 343 and 344 is the recommendation, um, the introduction of four hour time parking zones at the Riverheads boat ramp facility over uh, five of the 12 existing all day parking bays and uh, recommendation to the reconfig reconfiguration of separate dedicated car only disabled parking space. Um, this one has been moved by Councillor Madden, seconded by Councillor Chapman. All those in favour? And that's another 
unanimous decision. And justice to decide, I'm quite sure you'll be monitoring it very yes. well. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed we do. Um, <laughs> I know. Councillors, uh, on page 347, we have item 10.4.2, which is the Pialba, uh, sorry, Pier Street Railway Lines. Um, councillors, any questions around this matter? Yeah, there was an amendment, um, but... Incorporated. Right, our councillors. Um, any comment around this matter, item? Someone, Councillor Lewis, you'll no, you move it? Yep, uh, a seconder, please. Yeah. Councillor O'Keefe. <coughs> Councillor Lewis, comment? It's optional. Thanks, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, it's kind of you to provide this opportunity for a comment. Um, this matter was discussed at some considerable uh, depth uh, at the Heritage Advisory Committee and uh, the, the feeling was that there was no practical way to solve the road problem um, with, the, uh, with the lines intact and therefore uh, we, we thought we could nonetheless still um, provide a, a, a good uh, uh, reminder, a good reference to the heritage value by uh, um, interpretive signage is probably not quite the, the way I would have put it, but but some some uh, some work on, at the side of the road which will incorporate the uh, parts of the old railway lines and explain what the significance is of the uh, new concrete strips which will be put across. So I guess it's a, an, a, an imaginative and uh, artistic way of dealing with the heritage value of the site without uh, causing problems to. Uh, uh, to road traffic and so on. Thank you. Councillor O'Keefe. Oh, no. Thank you. Um, as per the officer's recommendation, um, that council remove the existing railway lines replaced with concrete strips on the same alignment of the existing rails as a part of Pier Street Road Reconstruction Works in point two. Develop interpretive signage in consultation with the council's Heritage Advisory Committee incorporating the old railway lines to acknowledge the heritage significance of the Urangan railway remnants and its connection to the Urangan pier in Harvey Bay's history. Um, councillors, all those in favour? And, and or another unanimous decision. Thank you, councillors. Okay, on to page uh, 352, item 10.4.3. Um, which is a community-led resilience project for the Orchid Beach airstrip. Uh, thank you, Councillor Light. And Councillor Chapman, thank you. Um, Councillors, Councillor Light, any comment? Uh, we're really good work from the officers uh, to identify this opportunity, enhances our resilience, our capabilities on the island. It's relatively a small amount of money for this activity as well and uh, great work from the officers. They've spoken to all the stakeholders there. I think it's a great partnership with the Progress Group as well. Indeed it is. <laughs> I've got nothing. Right now, councillors, um, recommendation over pages uh, 352 and 353. Um, all those in favour? Another unanimous decision. Thank you, councillors. Um, item 11, matters or motions which have been given by due notice. There are none today. Um, item 12 is questions on notice and there is none. Um, item 13, consideration of items placed on the agenda with the consent of the mayor. Again, there are none. And item 14 is general business. Um, councillors, start. Councillor Chapman. Uh, Councillor Light, sorry. I thought I'd get in uh, before you, Darren, regarding the um, hot rod show at uh, the showgrounds. Um, it was the odd bit of traffic, um, but uh, um, it, was, it, was, it was huge. I was there for two days uh, helping at Rotary. Uh, I believe we had 13,000 people, something like that, there on the first day. 
Uh, there was multiple food vendors, but uh, by lunchtime there was over 100 people in each one. It was just amazing. So great event, great for uh, the for the community. And as I've said before, I think at the last meeting talking to the organisers, um, uh, they are very um, pleased with the cooperation from council. Um, over and over again, they said the the reason we got it because of the attitude from the council, its officers, and senior management. So I congratulate the uh, the staff and the senior management securing that event, um, and also uh, the event at Burham Heads with the classic again. Even though there was a lot of rain, I was only there for a short period of time, um, but the people stayed. Um, they just put up umbrellas between the rain showers. Um, so still had just under 1,400 registered. Uh, participants, which is still makes it one of the biggest regional ones in Australia, uh, still gave away $75,000 roughly in prizes. So a great event and uh, hearing uh, some of the businesses, uh, they did very well over, um, over Easter. There was a lot of ice cream sold, a lot of fish cooked. Thanks. Um, I have a question to the CEO, or acting CEO, and it's in no way relating to your casting vote before Mr Acting Mayor. Um, the position of Deputy Mayor, I understood, was either going to come up um, for vote in this meeting or the next meeting. Uh, our resolution was for uh, it to be decided within... Uh, it had to be come back to Council within 12 months. Um, I'm wondering when that will occur. Was it June? Well, that, if that, that's that would be a June. Uh, through you, Mr. Acting Mayor, I'll double check what the resolution is, and uh, I'll circulate the, the answer to councillors just to make sure whether it's May or, or June. But I'll, I'll clarify that. <laughs> Councillor Hanson. Oh, yeah, this heavy, isn't it? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two, two items of general business. First of all, I just want to thank the um, Aldershot community for hosting us today. It's, it's really good to come out in these parts of the world and, um, and show that we do think about the outlying areas and, and share the love around. And that was a good thing. Now, the second thing is that, in relation to my apology I made at the last council meeting, um, I'd been informed by the tribunal that wasn't exactly what they requested me to do. Um, but in fact, I had to admit that I engaged in misconduct over comments I made online. Um, so I hereby acknowledge and admit to that, to that misconduct and, um, and move on. Um, James, can you inform us where we'll be next meeting? Ah, yeah, next council meeting. Very exciting times out in my part of the world. It'll be at T Bar, um, five, five minutes from my house. So maybe we can all go back to my farm and have. <laughs> Have some afternoon tea or something. Open invitation. Always beers. Always beers, councillor. Councillor Sanderson, down your side. Truscott, Lewis, Councillor Madden, thank you. Um, I would just like to come back up uh, Councillor Light's comments about the hot rod um, event on the weekend. Um, about five years of work went into that one. Um, and the feedback around our council officers was absolutely first class to this state where um, a couple of the other clubs and organisations wanted to borrow our facility and our staff. They could not believe how friendly and helpful the council staff were. Um, I will apologise for the traffic jam that was out there on Saturday, um, but to have so many people turn up and to people drive from Brisbane for the day to have a look at that event. Um, all around Australia, we had visitors from uh, Tasmania, Western Australia, yep, yeah, all over the place. Um, the committee that put that event together, uh, we went, I was a part of the original bid team, we went down and we, we sold the region um, several times to the, uh, the Queensland Council for the uh, street rods and they endorsed us, they, you know, they thought we had something to offer and the weekend I think we really proved that. The committee was led by a resident of Bundaberg, um, Ross Miller. Ross has aged immensely over the last few days and you know, for, he deserves to be the Citizen of the Year for what he and his committee uh, pulled together. We had uh, 
some local residents, Fred Farrell and his wife from Harvey Bay, residents from Brisbane, Gladstone, uh, Bundaberg, as I said, Gympie, South Burnett, they all pulled together to make that event happen. It was an amazing effort by volunteers. Um, and also all the volunteers who worked across the weekend and all the events that were across the region, these events couldn't happen without those, event, uh, without those volunteers, so acknowledge our locals. And also Anzac Day tomorrow. Um, it's a very sombre day, and as councillors we... We're very busy. We will get to a lot of these events. So um, encourage everyone, our community, to any... If you see a, 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 a retired veteran, a young or old, go up and shake their hand because, you yeah, know, sometimes they really need it. So that's it on Anzac Day and uh, general business. Anything from the officers? No? Oh, good. OK, with well, that being said... Uh, hang on. I've got a commitment in Harvey Bay at the special school, so I'm a bit stuck for room, so... Okay. so moving yeah, so can we move into confidential and have a five minutes? So, Councillor Hanson's move, uh, that we adjourn. Are we adjourning for a five-minute break? Five minutes. Yep, so... Recommendation. Um, Councillor Chapman, you're good to move this one. Yep, and yep, <laughs> all good. How's that? Yeah, I'd just like to uh, move that we add the words to the end there with the option to extend. In point three. Point three. Oh, sorry, which, sorry, which will be point two because point three has been removed. Correct. Right, right thank you. And uh, Councillor Hanson, you're going to second that one? Oh, sorry, Councillor Truscott. Yep. Jeez, I'm getting confused. So all those in favour? Thank you, councillors. That's carried okay. unanimously. Um, item 15.2 is the Boundary Road Extension Land Acquisition. And that was uh, Councillor Chapman was going to move that one. And that was seconded by Councillor Hanson. Um, all those in favour? Again, a unanimous decision. Um, 15.3, which is the Baker's Road Land Acquisition. Again, that was uh, Councillor Chapman was going to move that one. And Councillor Madden, sorry, move was Councillor Chapman, second Councillor Madden. All those in favour? Another unanimous decision. Um, item 15.4 is a Harvey Bay land acquisition. And that was uh, going to be moved by Councillor O'Keefe, correct? And Councillor Hanson. All those in favour? Uh, item 15.5 was to be held over. With, withdrawn, sorry. Apologies for that. Um, 15.6 is the application for conversion of a term lease to freehold at the Harvey Bay Boat Club at Yerangan. Uh, that was going to be moved by Councillor Chapman and seconded by Councillor O'Keefe. All those in favour? I just feel as I have to... I am a member of the Boat Club... The legislation says that simply being a member of the boat club isn't uh, a precursor for a conflict and I'm taking that as a gospel or legislation. So for that reason, I do not have a conflict in my view. I'm not declaring a conflict, but if any council believes I do have a conflict, um, if they speak now, I will leave the room. There's no one is speaking. Right out. So all those in favour? Another unanimous decision. Uh, item 15.7 is the Burham and District Heritage Society uh, matter. Um, Councillor Chapman, I do... Uh, Councillor Hanson, jeez, I've got the names wrong today. I do believe you were going to move that motion and seconded by Councillor Chapman. All those in favour? That's unanimous. So, councillors, thank you very much. And again, thank you to the Aldershot community for lunch and supporting this event today. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Richard. <laughs>